If there's one thing about China, it's that they really like dams. Today, there are around 87,000 dams scattered across the People's Republic. In other words, China has more dams than there are people living in Greenland. Among these are some truly phenomenal structures, not least the Three Gorges Dam, which more than 180 meters holds the title of the tallest dam in the world. Another remarkable example is the Bang Chao Dam in Henan Province, central China. At 180 meters tall, it might not rank among the highest in the world or even in China, but it remains an impressive feat of engineering, having once held back a reservoir containing nearly 500 million cubic meters of water on the River Ru. The dam was built in the early 1950s and was ostensibly designed to withstand a once in a thousand years flood. Later that same decade, it was upgraded to hold back a once in 10,000 year flood. Yet nature swiftly put that lofty label to the test, unleashing the devastating fury of what became known as Super Typhoon Nina. The dam failed spectacularly, and what followed for the nearby residents was nothing short of catastrophic. So, how did this failed megalith come into existence? Well, in the 1950s, the People's Republic of China launched a long series of ill-conceived projects. Chief among these was the Great Leap Forward, which began in 1958 and wound down by 1962, ultimately resulting in the catastrophic loss of up to 55 million lives. Spearheaded by Chairman Mao, the initiative aimed to industrialize China by relying on its vast labor force instead of capital investment and machinery. Small backyard furnaces popped up in villages and neighborhoods, accompanied by the establishment of communal kitchens designed to free women for work. Laborers were shifted from the fields to the factories and mines, leading to a rapid urban expansion across the country. Yet the Great Leap Forward was anything but a success. It significantly contributed to a host of subsequent disasters. For one, it led to a sharp contraction of the Chinese economy and caused millions of deaths due to starvation, execution, overwork, and suicide. It stands as the single largest loss of human life in history during peacetime. Additionally, this disastrous campaign played a substantial role in further calamities such as the Bang Chao Dam collapse. Earlier in the decade, another less than brilliant idea had taken shape. One of eastern China's principal rivers, the Huai, originates in Henan and historically flowed into the Yellow Sea on China's east coast. Henan province was, and remains, a catchment area for large volumes of rainfall, which made the Huai notoriously temperamental. Low rainfall triggered severe droughts, while heavy rainfall, common in the region, brought extreme floods. In fact, by the time the People's Republic of China emerged in 1949, the Huai had been subject to severe flooding almost every year for 400 years. Moreover, many existing dikes and piecemeal dams had been blown up by the previous Chinese government, the nationalist Kuomintang, in an effort to slow the Japanese advance during World War II. This action led to massive death and chaos while inflicting minimal inconvenience on the Japanese. The Huai remained exposed after the war ended, and as if to underscore this vulnerability, it was hit by particularly severe flooding in 1949 and 1950. So the Chinese Communist Party rolled up its sleeves and decided to do something about it all, kicking off what became known as the Harness the Huai River Project. The Huai River was fed by several tributaries from the mountains in West Henan, one of which was the Ru, also known as the Hong River. The idea was simple. What if a big dam was built near the mouth of the Ru to reduce water flow to a controllable level? Thus, the plans for the Bang Chao Dam were quickly drawn up, and the structure was built almost in the blink of an eye. It was revealed as soon as June 1952. What the Chinese had produced was, for its time, a behemoth of a dam. Mostly built of clay, it stood roughly 180 meters tall, about 20 meters taller than the Statue of Liberty. Its total length reached 450 meters, spanning the full breadth of the river, and then some. It was also a squat structure, being around 120 meters thick at its base. So while the Bang Chao might have been constructed from little more than clay and optimism, that didn't stop it from looking the part. Unfortunately, the rapid pace of construction left little time for critical considerations such as hydrology data, a fact that would prove to be a major error in the years to come. Still, China celebrated its new dam. The feeling of having built a structure capable of making Mother Nature flinch was a feather in the cap of the CCP, which had driven the Kuomintang onto Taiwan just three years earlier. With the dam's construction, the state could now claim to have partially resolved the centuries-old problem of the Huai River's devastating fluctuations. Perhaps more importantly for the party, the dam was designed to serve two additional purposes. First, it would generate electricity to power industrialization, not least the impending Great Leap Forward. And second, the CCP was obsessed with creating large reservoirs of water, and the Bang Chao proved particularly adept in this regard. 
It boasted a gargantuan reservoir capacity of 400,000 acre feet. That's roughly equivalent to 240,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. The reservoir, like many others, was intended to offset the frequent droughts in Henan province and to enable the state to tap into the vast agricultural potential of China's hinterlands. Aside from all that, the dam was designed to withstand a flood occurring once every millennium, so it all sounded pretty perfect, right? Well, no, not really. The impressive structure proved alarmingly weak practically as soon as it was completed. In 1954, the Huai River experienced another major flood, making it clear that the dam was not the robust structure it had been claimed to be. Not much is known about East China's 1954 floods since record keeping became rather obscure, but later accounts revealed that vast numbers of laborers and liquidators had to be deployed to reduce flooding in the Huai Basin. An unnamed Chinese official noted, quote, the Huai River Harnessing Commission was not completely aware of the complicated nature and the long-term requirements in harnessing of the Huai River. When the harnessing project was first launched, insufficient information and a lack of experience led to setting the standards too low for several projects. End quote. Reservoirs upstream were extended and consolidated. Bang Chao's height was increased by three meters, its overall capacity expanded further, and its maximum reservoir discharge was raised to just under 1,800 cubic meters per second. However, these improvements were still woefully short of what was needed. Cracks in the dam persisted, and unexpected sluice gates appeared, permitting water to seep through the facade. None of this exactly inspired confidence in the site's solidity, but the Chinese authorities, they had another plan. They would repair Bang Chao once more, this time enlisting the expertise of a partner widely regarded as the worst possible choice, the Soviet Union. Soviet engineers, already accustomed to managing poorly built infrastructure back home, were brought in during the mid-1950s to oversee the dam's consolidation. The refurbishment drew criticism from hydrologist Chen Qing, who had been involved in Bang Chao's initial design. Chen had recommended installing 12 sluice gates to prevent the structure from buckling under Henan's periodic heavy rains, but his advice was dismissed. The final design ended up with just five, aside from the occasional punctures that appeared intermittently. As reconstruction commenced, Chen consistently reiterated his objections. However, the CCP had little interest in entertaining the views of a vocal hydrologist, and Chen was soon sent off to Xinjiang. The reconstructed Bang Chao earned the nickname The Iron Dam, and it was described by its overseers as unbreakable. Yet only a few years later, it collapsed, ironically succumbing to the same type of hazard it had been built to withstand, a period of extreme inclement weather that wreaked havoc across China in the summer of 1975. This was Super Typhoon Nina. Now remember how I mentioned in the introduction that the dam was constructed from the outset to withstand a storm occurring once every thousand years? Well, there was one not so unforeseen problem with that plan. Nina, the kind of storm that only appears once every 2,000 years. In theory, this shouldn't have posed a problem. After all, with Soviet assistance, China had reinforced the Bang Chao Dam to endure the kind of storm that might strike only once every 10,000 years, supposedly. But even if that were true, it wasn't. The Soviet engineers were no longer involved. The Sino-Soviet split of 1960 abruptly ended such collaboration, and by the early 1970s, no Soviet technician had set eyes on the dam in nearly 20 years. The 10,000-year claim was soon debunked. Nina may not have been the most devastating storm since the Holocene period, but she still packed a serious punch. In fact, when it came to sheer force, the Bang Chao proved to be light work in comparison. Nina formed in the Philippine Sea in late July 1975. What began as a maritime storm soon intensified, with wind speeds exceeding 250 kilometers an hour, that's 155 miles an hour. Within days, the storm was classified as a super typhoon, and it began its ominous northward journey across the ocean toward China. Nina's first victim was Taiwan. Making landfall on August the 3rd, the storm pulverized around 3,000 homes across the island. The super typhoon triggered severe flooding and landslides, resulting in the deaths of 29 people. However, the devastation in Taiwan was minor compared to the destruction that would follow when Nina reached the Chinese mainland, landing on August the 5th. After landfall, the storm moved quickly inland, diminishing slightly from a super typhoon to a tropical storm. Even so, it remains an unusually powerful force and encountered a cold front over the Henan province that effectively blocked its path. Consequently, Nina became stationed directly over Henan, with its epicenter near the city of Zhumadayan, a location that was also home to the Banjiao Reservoir. And the clay dam quickly proved no match for the vicious typhoon. 
On the night of August the 5th, the full force of the tropical storm's wrath hit the residents of Zhu Marian. In a single night, Nina unleashed 18 inches of rainfall, almost half of what Henan province typically receives over an entire year. In fact, the volume of rain exceeded the highest ever recorded amount in the province by at least 40%. As a result, water levels in reservoirs throughout the region began to surge. The Bang Chao Reservoir reached its maximum capacity on the very first day of the storm, and water started to seep over the top of the dam. The sluice gates were opened, but as Chen Xing had predicted, there simply weren't enough to sufficiently release the swelling waters. And there was another problem. As mentioned before, Mao's Great Leap Forward involved extremely risky initiatives aimed at rapidly industrializing China. One such effort encouraged peasants to use their backyard furnaces to melt everyday objects like pots and pans to produce steel. This attempt was entirely futile since the resulting metal was of poor quality, mainly because the furnaces were not fueled correctly, with coal being the proper choice. Instead, laborers burned just vast amounts of firewood. As a result, large portions of Henan were stripped of their trees and foliage, elements that played a crucial role in preventing soil movement and sediment buildup. With the trees gone, the wetlands produced large volumes of silt that accumulated against the dam, hindering the outflow of water. With the sluice gates obstructed, the dam's ability to release water from its rapidly filling reservoir was severely reduced and massive pressure began to build. Disaster was now unavoidable. Despite the prestige of the Bang Chao, it was far from the only dam in the Henan region. More than a hundred similar structures dotted the province. Like Bang Chao, these dams were not robust constructions built to withstand Nina's wrath. They were largely white elephants, designed merely to satisfy the CCP's obsession with water accumulation. Regional administrators must have known they were unfit for purpose, as laborers were dispatched to reinforce them, even as Nina's relentless rains pounded down. Yet these efforts were misguided. Few realized that the unbreakable dam was, in fact, quite breakable a failure that would render any reinforcement of the remaining dikes futile. Moreover, Nina had disrupted telecommunications throughout Haman. As a result, engineers working upstream could not communicate with technicians downstream when the looming catastrophe occurred, nor could evacuation orders be effectively disseminated to the millions residing in the Huai Valley. The dam held out for two days, but its inevitable rupture occurred on August the 7th. First to fail was the nearby Shamartan Dam, Henan's second largest after Bang Chao, which gave way around midnight. Bang Chao endured a little more than 10 minutes longer. When the reservoir reached full capacity and water spilled over its rim, the dam suddenly burst open. Millions upon millions of cubic meters of water cascaded onto the surrounding flatlands, villages, and infrastructure as both the Bang Chao and Shimantan reservoirs emptied into the Huai River Valley in a flash. A huge tidal wave surged forward with reckless energy, causing smaller and mid-sized embankments to crumble one by one under its force. Like a series of falling dominoes, 62 dams in Henan province failed in a single night. And the fallout from this was nothing short of horrific. As later described by Human Rights Watch, the cascade from the failed dam tore through the Huai Valley and obliterated nearly everything in its path. Entire villages were pulverized, as were several provincial cities. The city of Su Ping lay directly in the path of the deluge, and its 200,000 residents were engulfed by water as they floated desperately in a bid to survive. Further down the route, the town of Wencheng was completely submerged, losing an estimated half of its 36,000 residents. Many locals drowned, while others were killed when their buildings collapsed or collided with surging debris, including electrical lines, shipping containers, and snapped trees. Over 10 million people were displaced, approximately 3 million acres of farmland were destroyed, and vast amounts of critical infrastructure were reduced to rubble. The Beijing-Guangzhou railway line, a key thoroughfare through Henan, suffered heavy damage and was out of action for months. Hundreds of thousands of people were forced to take refuge on the few structures that rose above the water, often resorting to the rooftops of their own homes until the floodwaters receded. Despite this, the CCP swept it all under the rug, and only a few survivors managed to have their accounts seen by the public. For years, these details remained hidden, even though internal reports eventually surfaced more than a decade later. To this day, the exact number of fatalities remains unknown, although the Chinese government ultimately provided an estimate of roughly 86,000 deaths. However, this figure was almost certainly a vast undercount. Because of the thousands of people killed by the force of the flood itself, the devastation that followed was equally severe. The downpours of Super Typhoon Nina gave way to the scorching heat of late summer, a scenario the CCP had, in fact, anticipated. They had raised reservoir levels in Hunan higher than usual, a decision that ultimately exacerbated the flood's impact. The heat wave, in turn, transformed Hunan into a breeding ground for new horrors. 
The relentless sun and damaged infrastructure provided the ideal conditions for diseases to spread rapidly. Dysentery, malaria, typhoid fever, hepatitis, food poisoning, and other infections began to ravage the surviving population. Any remaining health clinics were quickly overwhelmed by throngs of sick, destitute, and injured individuals. With farmlands depleted, reservoirs unable to replenish the fields, and large numbers of livestock wiped out, many locals faced starvation. Some even resorted to suicide, gripped by the profound hopelessness of their situation. Millions were left homeless and exposed to the harsh elements as the state scrambled to clear the mess and, above all, preserve its image. Notably, no public explanation was ever provided regarding how this disaster could have occurred in the first place. Mao died a year later in 1976, yet the suppression of information about the disaster outlasted him, continuing until the 1980s. It was only then, as plans for the massive Three Gorges Dam were taking shape, that details regarding the human cost were quietly revealed. A report from the Ministry of Water Resources, unearthed in 1989, disclosed a death toll of 86,000. However, this figure was based on an estimate by party officials from Henan province and was made only 12 days after the disaster. In contrast, another account by eight senior CCP engineers presented a very different estimate. They believed that more than 230,000 people had died, including fatalities caused by starvation, disease, and exposure, aside from an almost incalculable toll on infrastructure and farmland. In fact, their report was written as an objection to the construction of the Three Gorges Dam, highlighting the scale of the Bang Chow disaster and warning that a failure of the new dam would lead to unimaginable catastrophe. Their sobering words were no exaggeration. The Bang Chow disaster of 1975 is now widely recognized as the deadliest dam disaster in history. In the days following the catastrophe, Chen Xing returned to the scene. Now rehabilitated, he found that the CCP had decided to take his ideas more seriously. Soon, he was flown to Beijing to discuss a proposal for using aerial bombers to create emergency canals in the event of any future catastrophic overflow, a desperate measure that Bang Chao engineers had called for as the dam collapsed, though unsuccessfully at that time. Before the Beijing discussions began, Xing Wu was taken on an overflight of the ruined region alongside high-ranking Communist Party elites. The landscape unfolding beneath him must have been a harrowing sight, made even more so by the knowledge that this devastation would remain hidden from the public for years to come. Yet amidst the desolation, one detail would have caught Qing's and the surviving locals' attention in an instant. The unmistakable shape of a dam ruin marking where Bang Chao once proudly stood. There was simply no way the CCP could allow this lingering symbol of disaster to remain unaddressed. Although it took some time, the dam was eventually rebuilt. Construction began in 1987, more than 11 years after the catastrophe, and was completed in 1993. Many of the other destroyed dams were also rebuilt, including Shimartan, which returned to service in 1996. Despite opposition from some locals, the Bang Chow was restored and the new structure rebuilt several feet higher than before. The once great dam remains in use today, but has been dwarfed by many of China's newer dams, forgotten in the shadow of greater constructions. Its secrets known only to it and the people of Henan. Thank you for watching.